Welcome to our discussion today of the High Renaissance in Italy, and then briefly Mannerism, um, the artistic style after the High Renaissance. Most students at the end of the course tell me that they find this by far the most interesting section of the course. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at some of the great masters such as Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. And particularly for this lecture, it's very important that you supplement the lecture by watching all of the videos in the module. Most of them are very short, four, five, six minutes, and you can go through them all in perhaps two hours. And we're going to be seeing a lot of artwork, and so I'm not going to repeat everything that's in the lectures, obviously, um, when we're going through the PowerPoints, but this will serve as an introduction. <clears throat> so just to refresh your memory, this is what. <clears throat> so it's important, again, you understand the historical context. We've already seen previous slide, um, some of the major city-states, and they weren't constantly at war. They had sort of a love-hate relationship. They shared much in common in terms of culture, but they were political entities with their own small armies. Now, the High Renaissance is dated to 1503, about 100 years after the Renaissance began. Okay. And 1503 is the date that Julius II became Pope, and he only remained Pope for, for about 10 years to 1513, but he was a very, very powerful Pope. He was a powerful Pope in political terms, He's usually referred to as the warrior pope. He uh, raised large armies, which went to protect foreigners from entering the peninsula of Italy. And for our purposes, he was very, very, perhaps more important, he was very, very uh, powerful in terms of providing patronage to major Renaissance artists. Now, throughout the High Renaissance, it's not as if art disappeared from Florence. The Medici family still remained firmly in control of Florence and still paid significant amounts of money to patronize art there. However, the art world largely shifted to Rome because of papal patronage, starting with Julius II. So it's important to know that the High Renaissance is centered in Rome whereas the Renaissance itself began in Florence uh, some 100 years previously. <clears throat> in today's lecture, we're not going to cover all the, the fabulous artists of the High Renaissance, but we'll focus on what are called the Big Three, uh, Leonardo, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Now, Leonardo da Vinci is, I'm sure, known to all of you. Da Vinci is not his family last name. That means that he came, was born in the small town of Vinci, which is near Florence. He is often referred to as the iconic or quintessential Renaissance man. Why? He could do a lot of things and he could do them well. He was an outstanding painter. He was a renowned scientist, engineer, inventor, musician. And it's probably more possible 500 years ago to do this when there was a relatively limited field of knowledge for scientists, um, inventors, engineers. Um, unlike today, where it's not really possible to be a Nobel Prize winner in mathematics and uh, you know, some other field like biology or chemistry to do it all at once. The body of knowledge has just increased. <clears throat> but when someone says they're a Renaissance man, they're pointing to someone who can do many things. An example today might be a, a well-known scientist who's making major discoveries to try and find a cure for cancer, who's also a recognized a uh, member of a uh, orchestra or a painter or something like that. <clears throat>
<clears throat> now, Da Vinci started his professional life working as a painter. Here we can see, excuse me, working as an engineer. Here we can see one of his early plans for an airplane powered by a person. Others, many, many hundreds of thousands of years had tried to have self-propelled human flight and they had relied on their arm muscles. Well, Leonardo realized that the leg muscles are much stronger than the arm muscles. So he developed this design, actually built one, and some very strong man jumped off, fortunately a very short hill uh, to try and get in the air, but that um, did not succeed. Fortunately, the gentleman who tried this was not killed. This is one of Leonardo's early drawings <coughs> of a helicopter, the first known drawing of a helicopter. He actually never built a working prototype, but you can see the same um, blade system that's used in modern day helicopters. Leonardo, in addition to being an engineer, viewed himself very much as a scientist. This is an early sketch of his looking at the angles. Uh, and he did a lot of mathematical studies on angles. And we'll see a little more of this in a few minutes as regards his painting. This is the first known depiction of a bicycle. It looks very similar to the bicycles today. You can see two wheels with spokes, the handlebar, you can see the pedals, and the pedals are connected to the rear wheel with a, um, a chain. So this is very, very similar to the bicycles of today. Now this is one of his early sketches of a horse. Because of his scientific interest, Leonardo felt strongly that in order to paint people, horses, anything, one had to study them and draw many, many sketches. To this end, he would acquire recently died deceased horses and he would dissect them to study the bones, to study the muscles, to really see how they worked. This is one of his earliest sketches of a, um, a fetus in the womb. Now it violated church teaching at that time to dissect bodies. So he would pay people to illegally um, dig up freshly buried corpses. And he did this for a freshly buried corpse of a pregnant woman who had died uh, from some disease. And he meticulously took notes. There are many thousands and thousands of pages of these notes still preserved. And in fact, uh, virtually all of them are available on the internet. This is a famous um, sketch by Leonardo um, looking at the proportions of a, quote, standard man. As you can see, when the man has his arms extended at a certain angle, it looks like, I don't know, 25, 30 degrees, and he has his legs spread apart at more or less the same angle, about 30 degree, 25, 30 degrees, you can see that you can draw a circle connecting the tips of the fingers and the feet. And this was one of his studies of anatomy to look at proportion and symmetry in human beings. Now back to Leonardo's sketches of human anatomy. He went far beyond the earlier sketch we saw of a fetus. These look like they come from a modern anatomy textbook, but now, these were done about 500 years ago by Leonardo, the first to really do this in such great detail. And he's looking here at the drawing on the left, uh, clearly the skeleton. And the drawings on the right were all done for a painting um, that he did. And he wanted to see how the arm 
of an elderly man was structured, so he wanted to paint it just right. So he dissected a body, he looked at the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, bones, and everything, just to get that structure correct. Here we have another view of the same gentleman, and he's looking also at the, um, you see in the upper left-hand corner, the feet, the bones of the feet, the structure of the feet, because he wanted to understand how best to draw a human foot. And apart from his interest in art, he was just interested as a scientist in how the human body functioned. <coughs> Excuse me. And yet another view of the same gentleman. As you can see, incredibly detailed views. You can imagine how long it took to draw each of these detailed, um, they're more than sketches, they're, they're drawings. And, um, and he was very systematic in trying to measure the, the symmetry, the proportions. Now Leonardo left about 30 paintings and his most famous is a painting entitled The Last Supper, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, this is a very, very famous uh, scene in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. And he painted this as a fresco. You would call a fresco is painting on wet plaster for a dining hall of a monastery in Milan. And you can go see uh, the fresco this very day. And what is amazing about this, and this is really considered one of the masterpieces of Western art, and then certainly of the Renaissance, is the linear perspective, the emotions, and I will go through it on the next slide. So this is, again, The Last Sumper by Leonardo. Be sure you watch the video on this. <clears throat> and what you see here is the famous biblical scene where Christ is having supper with his apostles or disciples. Of course, at the time, he didn't know it would be his last supper with them, that he was shortly to be arrested and killed on the cross. And what we see, first of all, in terms of linear perspective, you can see the, the tapestries on the walls. Look at the top of them. You take a line and it's going back and everything goes to the top of Christ's head. And so what this does is automatically fo focuses your eye subconsciously. You don't think about it. When you first look at this picture, your eye focuses on Christ's head. And of course, his head is also framed by the largest of the three windows back there. And those three windows were painted to represent the Trinity of Christianity, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or Ghost, which we talked about later. Now, when we look at the apostles, they are certainly in a state of animation. They're talking. They're just not sitting there. And, and what are they talking about? Because Christ has said, one of you will betray me. And they're all looking at each other and said, who would it be? Who would it be? It wouldn't be me. Who is it? Who is it? Why is he saying this? And of course, Judas who's the third person on his left, on his right, our left. So if you count over three people from Christ on our left, looking at the painting, you can see Judith, Judas. And in the video, they have a nice close-up where you can see he's actually uh, clutching the, the pieces of silver that he was paid. And great importance also to this is the fact that Christ is indicating the bread and he also has his hand, his, Christ's right hand, on a cup of wine. And this is, of course, the famous and biblical sentence that this is pointing to the bread, this is my body, the wine, this is my blood, which forms the basis of the Eucharist or Holy Communion in the Christian re religion. Uh, be sure and watch this. One, Watch the video. One problem with this was Leonardo decided to experiment. Rather than painting a traditional fresco, which, as you recall from earlier in the course, is painting on wet plaster. So the paint 
would seep into the plaster and become permanent. He thought he would improve the method by first of all painting the wall with a white lead paint and letting it dry. So it's not really a fresco then because then he painted it and it looked wonderful when it was done but within a few short years some of the paint started falling off and this painting has been restored many many times. Um, actually the painting's last restoration finished I think about five or ten years ago. Um, so he experimented and again it looked great right when he finished but it didn't pass uh, many years. <clears throat> Another of Leonardo's masterpieces is Madonna or Mary of the Rocks. Here we see Mary portrayed not as the Queen of Heaven but as a real mother as any mother might be with Christ and two others. Now the background isn't really realistic. It, you can see the grotto and you can see in the far ground um, what looks like a, see, uh, a, a scene from a movie. <clears throat> One thing that's important that you can see in this painting is very typical of Renaissance paintings. This is the lines to structure the composition and it's often in the form of a, a triangle with the principal figure being at the apex of the triangle. Now by far the most famous painting in the world is the Mona Lisa which is now in the Paris at the Louvre Museum and if you ever go to see it there, perhaps some of you have, you'll never get very close to it. Anytime the museum's open they're usually 40 or 50 60 people in front of you so you'll see people holding up their cameras or phones to take a photo over other people's heads. Now for many of us when you walk if you saw this you didn't know it was Mona Lisa by Leonardo and you saw it in a museum you might be tempted just to walk by it's not at least for me a particularly interesting subject matter. Um, what is the intrigue of this painting? Well again be sure and watch the video in the module. <clears throat> I won't repeat, repeat all that but she has somewhat mysterious. Is it a smile? Is it a smirk? What is it? And you can see the very gentle hands. You can see a very good example of atmospheric perspective in the back, sort of the blurring the background. No one really knows who she was. Uh, she was certainly the wife of a wealthy person, most likely from Milan, and the question is why the person never ended up picking up the painting. Um, some have said uh, she was the secret lover of one of Mona Lisa's students who was standing, excuse me, one of Leonardo's students and that explains why she's not looking sort of at the painter but looking at the side of the painter because the way it worked um, great painters like Leonardo had studios other painters would pay to stand next to Leonardo watch his brush strokes and then try and imitate the work so one story is that she was the lover of um, one of Leonardo's uh, students will probably never know that. This painting has never been cleaned. That was a conscious decision to try and leave it the way it is. So it's rather dull. Many attempts at restoration or conservation over hundreds of years. People would put varnish on before and it would kind of turn yellowish. In the video you'll see exactly the same subject painted by one of Leonardo's students at exactly the same time because you can see analysts can see very very similar brush strokes but you'll see those paintings have been cleaned periodically cleaned and restored and the colors are vibrant. Now we'll move quickly to the second of our three great masters and this is Raphael. <coughs> Raphael is known as one of the the great Renaissance um, masters and he particularly relied heavily on the ordered composition um, so typical of Renaissance artists. 
his human form, forms are particularly well known and realistic chubby little children. This is Raphael's rendition of Madonna or Mary of the Meadow. You recall just a few minutes ago we saw Leonardo's uh, Madonna of the Rocks. The difference is quite significant. At first glance you'll notice behind Mary you have a very very realistic scene of the Italian countryside, a lake and some hills and whatnot. You don't have grottos that look like there's from a science fiction movie. You see Mary is barefoot. You see the children certainly look like children, a little chubby, chubby faces, chubby arms. Um, now earlier in the course when we were looking <coughs> at Greek philosophy, we saw this particular painting entitled The School of Athens. Um, earlier when we were looking at Greek philosophy we focused on the difference between Plato and Aristotle who are of course in the center of the photo with um, Plato at our left and Aristotle on our right in the blue robes and their followers over 2,000 years on various on, on this their sides. What we want to focus on this now is look at the perspective. You can you can see how the eye go, gravitates right to Plato and Aristotle because of the use of linear perspective. And you can also one example is you can see the arches, the, the classic curved Roman arches, large one in the foreground, and then they get smaller and smaller with a vanishing point right between the head of Plato and Aristotle. And the video on this for four or five minutes will show you some other um, orthogonals that help your eye focus. Again, here are some of those orthogonals in a carefully structured painting to focus your eye directly on the focal point. Now the last of the three Renaissance masters that we'll consider is Michelangelo. <clears throat> His first masterpiece, which was, was a, uh, uh, marble carving when he was 18 or 19 years old. This is it here, it's called Pieta, it means piety in, in Italian. And you can see Mary holding her son, Christ, just after he would take him down from the cross. The drapery is absolutely fantastic. You can just see the folds there. You can see how Christ is, the weight of Christ is realistically shown. Mary's right arm to our left is pinching up the, the, um, the waist, the, the flesh on the chest of Christ as would really happen. Now one criticism is that Mary is idealized. She doesn't look like most mothers of a 33 year old son, but be that as it may, this is um, one of the great great masterpieces of the Renaissance. It's now located in the um, St. Peter's Basilica the Pope's church, the largest Catholic church in the world, and um, it's in the side altar to the side. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, in 1972, a mentally ill man who believed he was Christ uh, attacked the, the Pieta with a hammer, and he actually used a geologist's hammer, which has a sharp pointy end and he did that when he turned 33 because he said that is the age when Christ was born and in front of a group of horrified tourists he shouted I am Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Uh, he was arrested shortly thereafter because the church was open and he was never charged with a crime but rather he was found mentally ill and sent to a mental institution. When he hit the statue, because there was no protective glass at that point, anyone could just jump up and uh, attack it. 
Um, he broke off the nose of Mary as well as her arm and eyelids. Uh, what I found particularly disturbing is the horrified tourists, some of them actually picked up broken pieces of marble and ran out of the church so they could go home from their trip to the Vatican and, and rightly claim that they had a piece of the Pieta. Um, it, fortunately, they were able to repair it. Uh, new pieces of marble were somehow made to look old, polished, and glued in. So when you look at it now, um, perhaps an expert can, but most of us could not recognize the difference. This is a photo from a video, a surveillance video of the man attacking Mary. And here we see the statue of Mary. We can see her arm chopped off there. And this is what the statue looks at like today. Uh, you go to the Vatican, it's up in the side altar. It was in the same location when it was ta attacked, but they didn't have that layer of bulletproof glass in front of it. And no photograph does justice to the marble, but I think you can get a better sense of it by, again, there's a short video on the Pieta. <clears throat> well, the Pieta made Michelangelo famous. And so <clears throat> his next work commissioned was commissioned in Florence. The city government asked him to sculpt a statue of David. Um, and you recall David from the famous biblical story was went out sort of a weak, almost teenager and the opposing army had Goliath, this huge warrior. And Goliath said, rather than have the two armies attack, I will fight with any, any single person. So David volunteered and everybody laughed, but he said he had God on his side. He went out and with a sling, he threw a rock and it hit um, Goliath between the eyes and killed him. So you can see in this statue, which is much larger than life size, it's almost 20 feet tall, you can see David looking at Goliath, a serious expression, because there's Goliath, this big guy moving back and forth and huffing and puffing, and David is trying to figure exactly how he will move so he can throw the rock. He has one chance um, at Goliath, so you see David has his weight on his right foot. His left foot, he doesn't have any weight except on the toes. And on his left shoulder, David has the sling. The sling was a piece of cloth, in which at the end was a little pocket to tie a rock, or not to tie, to, to hold a rock. And then you would swing that around, and just at the right angle, the rock would come shooting out. It's not the kind of slingshot that I and many of you may have used as youngsters, which looks like is V-shaped and you pull a rubber, a rubber cord and shoot out a rock or something. Well, this was supposed to go up on the side of the Florence Cathedral. When it was finished, everybody in Florence was just astounded at its beauty, its realism. So they decided to put the statue in the, in the center of the Florence city square where it remained for many, many centuries, subject to the rain, the, the snow there in the winter, the heat, etc. But finally, it was uh, moved into an art school, and you go to Florence today, and what you have outside is a very realistic copy of this, because they needed to remove it from the elements, and unfortunately, the marble was starting to deteriorate because of acid rain. In recent decades, the number of cars um, in that part of Italy and, and trucks were contributing to pollution that acidified the rain. And when acid rain comes down, it has a corrosive effect on marble and many other substances. Another famous work by <coughs> um, now you notice on 
his head what looked like horns. Well, they're not really horns. They're supposed to symbolize rays of light. This is the divine light of God because he has just spoken with God. <clears throat> so Michelangelo was quite content. Um, finally, he, he didn't want to go to Rome, but at least he was doing what he loved most, and that was sculpture. So he was sculpting these many, many figures for Pope Julius's tomb, when all of a sudden Pope Julius went to him and said, please stop the work on the tomb. I want you to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Now the Sistine Chapel is the private chapel, it's a small church of the Pope. Well, Michelangelo was furious, he was frustrated because he loved sculpture. But since the Pope was his spiritual leader, he, he said he would do it. So he went um, just down very close to where he was doing the tomb and he painted one of the great, great um, paintings of the Renaissance, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He was so furious when he finished that he hadn't been able to do sculpture. He signed it Michelangelo, quote, comma, sculptor. He wanted the world to remember him as a sculptor, not a painter. Well, I think the world has remembered him as both. Now, the Sistine Chapel, well, it's a small chapel for the Pope. It's not that small. The ceiling is 5,800 square feet. That is probably two to three times the square footage of a standard suburban house in this area, Houston. A standard house, two stories, has approximately 3,000 square feet. So he painted that all by himself with just one assistant who helped put the wet plaster on because this is a classic fresco. And this was 70 feet high. So he had to go in, climb the scaffolding. And of course, then there was no electric light and they had to have a candles and paint. Most of it he painted standing up and leaning back. Although in some corners he did have to get on his back. It was very bad for his eyesight. They said that his eyesight deteriorated significantly during this process because there wasn't much light. There are over 300 figures on the ceiling. It's just uh, magnificent. Be sure you watch the video on this one also. <clears throat> now, the ceiling shows biblical scenes from the Old Testament, starting with God's creation of the earth, Adam and Eve, You'll see familiar scenes, Noah's Ark, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but by far the most famous is in the very center of the ceiling. It's, it's God passing the spark of life and the soul to Adam. And the figure is called the creation of Adam. So this is a view of the ceiling. And you can see how busy it is. Every, every square inch has paint on it, um, except right around the spark of life with Adam, which we'll see in a moment. On the sides, you'll see frescoes painted by other artists on the walls. You see the windows up there. It's not that, not that many windows. This is not a Gothic cathedral. And where we are, we're at the entrance, where as a tourist, you would come in the far end, you can barely see the candles of an altar. That is the, where the Pope every day, to this very day, uh, says mass, which is a requirement of every uh, Catholic priest. And above that is Michelangelo's other famous work, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, the uh, Last Judgment. So we'll talk about that at length in a few minutes. But for the moment, let's focus on the ceiling. Uh, the textbook will give you the 12 scenes. You don't need to know clearly what all the 12 are, but they're all biblical scenes from the last, from the Old Testament. And if you look at the ceiling, those V's, the V shapes look like they're made of masonry or concrete, but no, those are all painted in and they're very three dimensional. So let's go back to the center of the painting where we have um, the spark of life. <clears throat> 
Now this is the the sketch that Michelangelo uh, did before painting. Before he painted anything, he did multiple sketches, just like Leonardo. He studied the human anatomy. He he wanted to get the muscles right, and so he these people were very very diligent in making sure that all the hum, the human anatomy was realistic. And of course, this was something that the ancient Greeks and the Romans also tried to achieve. <clears throat> so this is the final product. Uh, this is the center panel of the ceiling. We have God on the right, dressed in white, sort of flying through the air with angels around him. There's a real sense of motion there. And there we have Adam, who's quite lethargic, sort of until he gets the spark of life, which makes him human, and of course it gives him a soul. And you'll notice the background there in the very center is left white. Michelangelo did that on purpose because he wants the eye to focus on those two hands and the spark of life. <clears throat> and the last work we'll look at by Michelangelo is... The Last Judgment, which I already showed you, is above the main altar. It's very significant that this was painted 30 years after the ceiling. Now, why is that significant? Because during those 30 years, the Protestant Reformation started in Northern Europe, and I'm going to talk about that for a minute, and that was started by Martin Luther. This was essentially a split in the church. There was only one Christian church in Europe, and Western Europe until this point. That was the church headquartered in Rome, in the Vatican, with the Pope. And now we're going to have Protestant denominations separate from the church and the church, the main church at that time, which became, became known as the Roman Catholic Church. So Protestant Reformation, let's look at the words. Protestant comes from protest, reformation, because they wanted to reform the church. The church was started by Catholic priests. Excuse me, the Reformation was started by Catholic priests and monks, very loyal to the church and the Pope. But then they had differences, both in terms of the practices of the church and, most importantly, theological differences. The Reformation is dated to 1517 when Martin Luther in Germany, he was a Christian monk, posted his 95 theses or 95 statements on the door of a church. They were posted in Latin. And these were essentially his complaints with the church under the Pope. <clears throat> I will get into those in the next slide, what the main ones were. But it's important to note the historical context. If Martin Luther had done that in France or Spain, he would have been immediately arrested and been killed and burnt at the stake as a heretic for violating the teachings of the church. But he did this in Germany. He was German. And at that time, the German princes were semi-autonomous, and they started to support him. And one of the reasons they supported him perhaps wasn't so much for theological reasons, but the fact is they thought the Pope had far too much political and military control. Let's look briefly at Luther's main concerns with the church doctrine. Sorry, misspelled doctrine there. There are three or four videos in the modules, again, short videos, which will run you through this. And this is essential if you want to understand how Catholicism and Protestantism differ, how they broke at this time in the 1500s. And this also helps explain much of subsequent uh, European history where there were actually wars between Christians and and Protestants um, because both sides felt that they had the true religion and that the other side was evil. 
and this continued until the 1990s in Northern Ireland where the Catholics and the Protestants battled and in fact there's some concern today that they might um, continue those battles. There were other political issues and economic issues in, the, in Northern Ireland but underneath a lot of it was antagonism towards the other religious faith people had brought up. Um, I used to, when I was at the American Embassy in London, I used to travel to Northern Ireland in the early 1990s when there were, there were actual bombings going on and I would talk to people on both sides and they both, children on both sides, children like in kindergarten, and they both had been told at home how the other religion was, quote, evil. And, you know, they, so people, we all learn what we are told at home, right? Well, back to Martin Luther his major, major concerns with the church doctrine. One was the sale of indulgences to reduce time in purgatory. Now for the church, at that time there was one Christian church, and this is still the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, that in addition to heaven and hell, you go to hell right away if you've really had a terrible life. You go to heaven right away if you've had a perfect life, but most of us in this uh, scheme would go sort of to purgatory, purgatory from which we would not go to hell. We'd go to heaven eventually, but, <clears throat> but we had to go there to purge any remaining sins that we might have. And, you know, that would be a certain amount of time. And then we go to heaven. Now, what the church had, <clears throat> and this is still the official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, that you could get time off, if you will, for certain good deeds um, and would reduce your time in purgatory. Well, this was very common at five, six hundred years ago, where in addition to good deeds like helping give food to the poor, things like that, the church and the members of the clergy priests and monks would sell indulgences. And part of it was if you bought a certain relic. But at this very time, Pope Julius II was trying to raise money to build uh, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, and he needed a lot of money. So many, many people were, were in essence, buying, they were making large contributions to the church, and they were getting a lot of time off of purgatory. Now, Martin Luther didn't like this. He thought that that wasn't correct. <clears throat> Another thing was Martin Luther did not agree with the church doctrine that you were saved by a combination of faith and good works because Luther felt he personally was trying to be good, but he wasn't perfect and there were no amount of good works that he could do. Now those good works would be buying indulgences, also helping feed poor people, etc. And so a major difference to this day is that Protestants, starting with Martin Luther, said that you can be saved by faith alone. All you need is the correct faith. Good works are fine, that's great, they should be encouraged, but that is not what determines um, whether you go to heaven or hell, it's, it's your faith. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> Martin Luther did not accept that only the Pope and the hierarchy of cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and priests could interpret the Bible. And for that reason, in the church, called the Catholic Church under the Pope, it was not permitted to have the Bible translated from Latin, it must be in Latin. Well, that automatically limited the number of people who could read it because only the, uh, the very well-educated could read Latin. Martin Luther said, no, the Bible is the word of God. It should encourage everyone to read it. And to that end, it should be translated into the local or vernacular language and so, in fact, Martin Luther himself translated the Bible into German, and others translated the Bible into other uh, languages. And this 
effort was greatly aided by what we saw in the last lecture, the printing press, the major advances in the printing press, largely Gutenberg's invention of movable type, which reduced the cost of printing. And so Bibles could be printed much more cheaply. And the literacy rate rose significantly over this 100-year period. It's estimated the literacy in Western Europe in the year 1500 was only 5% and it rose to 20% by 1600. Now you might say to yourself, well, 20% is still pretty low. Well, it is, but if 20% of the people can read the Bible in a local, their own language, people who couldn't read could always find someone who could read who would read it to them. So, the, so to this very day, this is a significant difference between Catholics and Protestants. Martin Luther, but other Protestants more, claimed that the Bible did not support some of the sacraments that had been established by popes and the what's now the Catholic Church. And they particularly pointed to the sacrament of Holy Communion or the Eucharist, where to this very day, Roman Catholics believe that during the Mass, the priest changes the bread to the actual body of Christ and the blood to the actual blood of Christ and what's called transubstantiation. Protestants reject this and say no, the bread and wine are only representative of the body and blood of Christ. <clears throat> Some Protestants, not all, objected to uh, baptism of infants saying they had no free will and they pointed to Christ's own baptism by John the Baptist, which happened obviously when he was an adult and he made that decision. It's important to remember that Protestantism never was a single unified faith. Martin Luther started, started the ball rolling in 1517, but very shortly after you had other Protestants such as John Calvin in Switzerland, who started another uh, denomination of Protestantism, quite different. Um, and so today, there are literally many dozens and dozens of Protestant denominations. And this is not unusual given that each denomination believes that it has the correct um, interpretation of the Bible. Okay, now back to Michelangelo. We had a digression there to talk about the last should be to talk about the Protestant Reformation. Again, we've seen this slide before. Um, we see the last judgment on the far wall there, right above the altar. And of course, the ceiling we already talked about. Now this was painted some 30 years after the ceiling. The ceiling shows biblical scenes from the Old Testament. Now we see Michele Michelangelo's anger come through in this painting. This is Michelangelo's anger with the Protestant Reformation. Now the Protestant Reformation at this time was still in Northern Europe. You know, Germany and then spread shortly thereafter to England and took a long time to reach Italy. But Michelangelo had heard of this and as a very devoted Christian loyal to the Pope he was outraged. Again, there's a, a video on this in the module. Be sure and watch the video. Um, I think you'll enjoy it very much, particularly some of the close-ups here. So what we see in the center is Christ, last judgment. We saw this before, didn't we? Before the Renaissance, this was at the door of the cathedrals. But look at the movement there. There's Christ, strong, muscled, with right hand raised, and he's pointing to his left, our right, which are the devils. And, and he's saying, you go to hell, you go to hell. And you can see at the bottom right, the fires of hell, the actual fires of hell there. And you can see the devil's helpers there taking pieces of wood and oars and beating people to heaven, to hell, because nobody wanted to go to hell, obviously. You can see in the very foreground, the cross and the candles, that is the actual altar where the Catholic priest says Mass every day. So it's a very, very strong portrayal. This is a huge painting. You can see on cross, 
Christ's right or left? Heaven. Well, the lucky people are going there. You can see on the left part of the painting, uh, the lower part, large muscular angels blowing trumpets very loudly to wake the dead up because this is the last judgment. Again, you really need to see the video which has close-ups of every one of these elements. And the key point to remember here is the last judgment was painted some 30 years after the Sistine Chapel and in the meantime the Protestant Reformation had started in Northern Europe and that had just infuriated Michelangelo because Michelangelo um, was very loyal and devout to the Pope. And down there in the lower right, you can see some figures who some art historians claim are um, some of the, the major players in the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> well, the Renaissance the High Renaissance, the Renaissance itself, lasted roughly 200 years. And in the late 16th century, around the year 16, um, 1600, we saw the Renaissance die out, and we had a, a school of art known as Mannerism. Now we lose the naturalism we saw in the Renaissance with artists copying nature directly looking at detail, realism, people started copying art itself. The figures become distorted, elongated. There's far less three-dimensionality. There is some, but much less. The figures are flattened. There's no focal point. And we'll see the pastel colors don't, don't blend. Let's just look at one example here of that. In the, this is a Potormo's entombment of Christ. Christ has been taken out of the, taken down from the cross and he's gonna be placed in the tomb. And what you can see here is there's no real focal point. What do we look at? Well, in the lower left, or in the left, we have Christ there who's dead, obviously. But in the upper right, we have Mary. What's the center point? There is no center point of this. There's and it's not very realistic. You look at the figures. There is Christ, a 33-year-old man, and he's being held up under the arms by a very petite angel standing on tippy toes. Um, it doesn't look like a person um, of that stature could stand on tippy toes and hold up a fully grown 33-year-old man. Likewise, we have Christ's legs being held up by another person who's sort of on their tippy toes. It's just not realistic. None of it is. The figures are elongated. And the final slide, this is just a close-up of Christ, again, being supported in a very unnatural, unrealistic way. Um, nor do you see much detail on Christ's body itself, nor on any of the bodies. So this is mannerism. And so thank you very much. Uh, this is the last lecture in this course.